In this presentation, we're going to look at how to add data tables and charts to our models. I'm going to use the DCF model that we've been building in class as the example, but you can add tables to any mathematical model or equations that you would like. Let's have a look now at our DCF model. What I've done here is built a table area which at this moment consists of a column of values that I want to insert into the discount rate variable. I have this column of values between Q42 and Q49, between 8% and 15%, that I want to use as discount rates. That's in the blue highlighted area. One column to the right and one column above. I have this green highlighted cell. That's where I must insert an equation which in one way or another is going to depend on the values chosen in the blue highlighted area. In this case I want to simply take the net present value. And so rather than write some complicated equation in here, I'm simply going to go equals D39 which will bring into the table the value of the NPV that results from my discounted cash flow model. This means I can use all of the power of my DCF model condensed down into this one table. So I choose that. Next thing I have to do is tell Excel that I'm going to be inserting these values between 8% and 15% into the discount rate cell. And to do that, I choose the whole area of the table, which runs from Q41 across to R49, highlight that, point click and drag with the mouse. Then I go to the data menus, select what if analysis, pull down to data table, and a small window appears that enables me to put in up to two variables. A lot of people get confused as to whether or not to use the row input cell or the column input cell when they're building their tables. The way I like to remember it is that if I have a column of values that I want to input into my table, then I use the column input cell option. If I have a row of values, I use the row input cell. So here I have a column of values, so I'm going to use the column input cell. And here I'm going to select the discount rate cell, which in this case is H6. I hit OK in the data table window, and the table is now populated. The buff area now has a series of numbers in it, and each one of those represents the value of the equation in the highlighted green cell, evaluated for each different value of the discount rate. That's lovely because it's very powerful, very fast. If the equation in the green cell doesn't in some way vary as a result of the values in the column of value inputs, and that often can be because either my equation is incorrectly selected or I'm inserting those numbers, those values into the wrong cell, then you'll find that the numbers in the buff area do not change. And so if you find you get that, the buff numbers don't change, check that you're putting the values into the right place. In this case, I'm putting my numbers into H6. If I tried putting them into I6 or some other place where they're not going to do anything, my NPVs won't change, of course, because the discount rate won't change. And likewise, if my equation isn't in some way even indirectly affected by the discount rate, then again, my numbers won't change. So for instance, if I was to put into the green highlighted cell, maybe D4 or something, which is the cost, I would get the cost simply reproduced for each value. We now move to two-dimensional tables, tables which evaluate two variables simultaneously. In this area, you'll see that I've put a column of values in this blue highlighted column, 
between 23,000 and 30,500, which represents different values for rents that I want the DCF model to evaluate. One column to the right and one row above, I have a row of values which I want to use for different selections of property growth. They're set up so that at the intersection of that row and column, I have the green input cell again, and I'm going to use that again to give me the net present value. And so the equation that goes in the green highlighted cell, you don't have to use these highlights by the way, is simply equals D39. I use pretty much the same routine as I did before. In this case, I select the entire area of the table, which in this case runs from E88 across to N104. Go into the data menus, what if analysis, pull down to the data table. And now I have a column input, which is going to be property growth. So I go and find the property growth or the market growth, which is H7, put it into that first window. I also have the rent, which is input into cell C14. And so the column input cell is C14, hit OK. And the buff area of my table is now populated with the results for net present value for the various combinations of rent and property growth. They range from minus $37,000 up to positive $82,000. That's my table done. That's very fast and easy. You can run data tables for any combination of variables or individual variables, and you can do it as a column of values singly or a row of values singly. It's up to you. You can whiz these things up so quickly that you know, it's more time to talk about them than to actually do them. The problem with the two input cells or the two input data tables is that they're relatively hard for a reader to follow. Just a bunch of numbers and a great big patch on your report page isn't very interesting and very informative. A better way to communicate what's essentially going on is to turn them into a graph. Excel has a nice and powerful graphing function or a charting function, which we'll go over briefly now. There are a couple of wrinkles or oddities with the Excel charting function, which we'll explain as we go along. It's not quite as tidy as it once was. For those of you with absolutely ancient Windows machines back around the late 1980s, you might have an absolutely ancient version of Excel where this was surprisingly easy compared to what it is today. Oddly enough, as Windows and Microsoft Office has improved, the graph function has actually gone backwards. But I'll leave that as something for you to discover, or at least read in history books or something. How do we do graphs? Well, at present, what we must do is insert the graph. So the first thing we do is select the area to be graphed, which is the buff area, in this case, F89 across to N104, point, click and drag that. You then go into the insert menus, go across to the charts and select, I'm going to use the line chart for this demonstration. Pull down, I'm going to use the first option of the line chart and simply select that and instantly we have a chart being produced for us. However, I would describe this chart as very unfriendly. Two reasons is unfriendly. First of all, the x-axis isn't labeled with anything useful. The x-axis really should be the values for the rents, ranging from 23,000 up to 30,500. And so if you submit this in a report or what have you, it's not really telling your reader a great deal, because they don't know what 1, 2, 3, 4 up to 16 really means. We have to label the x-axis. The second thing, uh, it's not very useful as each one of these lines is simply called series. Series 1, Series 2, Series 9, and so on. They really should be our different values of property growth. Again, we have to edit that in using Excel's edit function. To do that, we go into the chart tools. We select the select data option. And here we come up with a complicated looking window. 
and we need to navigate ourselves through that. The first thing we want to do is label the x-axis correctly. On the right hand side we have the horizontal category axis labels option. We simply go into that and hit the edit button. A little window comes up which enables us to input an array of cells which will become our x-axis. In this case it's going to be E89 to E104. Hit OK with that and you do find that the chart now looks a little bit more civilized because at least we've got the rents in there. The next stage is not quite so elegant because we've got to do it one series at a time and that is we have to label the series with what they really should be which is property growth values from minus 1% up to 7%. We do that by selecting the series name first one is simply called series one key edit where it comes up and asks for our series name we simply click on the series name the first one is comes from F88 and we hit OK there we'll notice the first series is no longer called series one it's called minus one percent we have to do that manually for each one and I've been asking my students for some time if anyone knows a faster way of doing this by all means tell me because it drives me positively batty and we have to do it for each of the labels across the, the columns I'll let you finish up and do that in your own time by the time we've done that we end up with the table at least telling us what we're actually doing. We've got the rents across the x-axis and we've got the legend showing us the property growth values which is each one of those traces. The next thing we need to do is add the title to the uh, chart and also label the axes. For some reason Excel at present at least is not particularly friendly but if we go into the area of the chart tools which is chart layouts we find there we have the different options for how we lay out our chart which is largely to do with whether or not it has legends and headings on this used to be a separate window but now it's all stylized for us the only problem is that it doesn't actually give us the most common and useful option which is where we have both axes with titles on them and a title I'm going to use the very first option which gives us a chart title and the Y axis labeled. You'll find the last row gives you the prospects of being able to label both axes which is far more suitable. The only problem is that it puts rather nasty little vertical lines on each one of the rent values so I'm not going to do that in this demonstration. Again you might be able to find a better way of doing it but this gets us relatively close. To change the chart title to what you want, you simply highlight where it says chart title and over type it with what you want. In this case, it's going to be net present value versus our rent and our property growth. The vertical axis, I'm going to relabel as net present value in PV and in brackets I'm going to put dollars because it's always a good idea to put the units in. Now we have a chart which is looking fairly civilized. We need to put a x-axis in. I'll demonstrate what happens when we go to the only option that enables us to do that. Here we have these vertical lines I was telling you about and we have the option at least to label the x-axis. So I'm going to label the x-axis as rent. Again I'm going to put in brackets the unit, very important, and hit return. So now I have my chart looking fairly presentable. All I need to do is one way or another, edit out those 
vertical lines, which I can do by selecting one of the vertical lines. And you'll notice they all get highlighted. And I right click in the Windows environment, hit delete, and that takes them out. And so now I have a graph which is quite presentable. Doing that while the chart work is a little bit tedious, it's not very, very difficult. And I recommend that you build tables for as many variables and combinations of variables as you're able to. You'll finally be able to run the tables up very, very quickly. Running the charts up, as I say, is a little bit tedious with the way that Excel works at present. Um, but certainly run the tables up for those variables that you think are important or worthy of some kind of note in your reports. It does mean a little bit of tedious work as we've laid out, and we just look forward to when Excel fixes those bugs.